You once asked me like, what predominates my experience at Goldman Sachs? I said, I don't think I ever had a day where I was completely unafraid. I, at this stage of my life, you know, I could read my own resume and know I did well, but I tell you, I've never walked into a room where I wasn't thinking that, oh my God, in, in 30 seconds, they're gonna find out what a phony and fraud I am. My, my, my father, in very Illinois, my father built a bomb shelter. A bomb shelter with an air filter and a chemical toilet. I, don't care. I used to always say to people, I'm not in the I'm not in the forecasting business. I'm in the contingency planning business. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas from some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Lloyd Blankfein, former chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs. Lloyd joined Goldman Sachs in 1982 became a partner in 1988, and served as chairman and CEO from 2006 through September 2018. I had spent the first 20 years of my career at Goldman Sachs in investment banking, and I got to know Lloyd very well when I became president and CEO, and he did his very best to educate me on markets, trading, and risk management. Lloyd worked hand in hand with me as Goldman Sachs chief operating officer as we transitioned the firm from a private partnership to a public company. Lloyd, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Hank. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm delighted to have you, and we're going to have a lot of fun today. A matter of fact, every conversation with you is a lot of fun. And although most of our listeners know you as a man who guided Goldman Sachs through the financial crisis, and then almost 10 years later, handed over what was a, a preeminent financial institution. What is a preeminent financial institution to your successor? But I want to rewind and start at the beginning. You certainly didn't grow up wealthy. You grew up in the Bronx. What was it like in the Bronx in the 60s? Yeah, well, just a slight correction. I was born in the Bronx and, um, and my family, in search of a better life, moved to the East New York section of Brooklyn. By the way, a better life they didn't necessarily find. But I did grow up uh, in Brooklyn uh, in the housing projects. And so I've had that, ex I had that experience. I'd say I'd like to recount how you know, I suffered and was tortured and I walked uphill to and from both ways to and from school. But you know, I did have a, an intact nuclear family. We grew up very modest means, again, in public housing. Uh, but, you know, I didn't suffer the way other people did. And the fact of the matter is, I left home when I was 16 and went to college. And I went to very fancy uh, undergraduate school and law school and everything. And I would say, for a quarter of my life, I had some obstacles to overcome. And the other three quarters of my life so far, I've, I've been absolutely privileged. Yeah, but I still want to go back uh, to, to the beginning. You were the first member of your family to go to college. Uh, the nuclear family, did your, your parents impress the importance of an education on you? I'd say yes, as an abstract matter. They, they really hadn't had much experience. I had an older sibling also that didn't go to college. Um, and so there was no real preparation for that. Uh, I'd say the real spur to me was, frankly, wanting to get out of there in some ways. It wasn't, a, I, I won't say, you know, it wasn't a tortured life, but I always had it from my first memory. I wanted to get away and I wanted to go out of town to a school and, and, I, and I did. And so I was, I was very, I was quite motivated uh, just to be in a different place than where I was. Well, you know, to me, you know, one of the things that always characterized you, as long as I've known you, is you had no sense of entitlement. You were always striving to learn more, to get better, to, you know, so you're all, all, always working. Was that something you had from the beginning? Uh, where, where does that come from? You know, I don't know, Hank. Uh, you know, I've heard that, the, you know, among very successful people, there's something called the imposter syndrome, where everybody walks into a room and thinks they're fooling everybody and they're about to be just uncovered. Uh, I, I would say that, you know, I've always been a bit of a kind of a fatalist. I've always thought that, 
I would say that I'm not even sure I ever really believed that I had what I had. I, at this stage of my life, you know, I could read my own resume and know I did well, but I tell you, I've never walked into a room where I wasn't thinking that, oh my God, in, in 30 seconds, they're gonna find out what a phony and fraud I am. And so I, that, I was always driven by a sense of anxiety and fear. We talked about this in the past. You once asked me like, what predominates in my experience at Goldman Sachs? I said, I don't think I ever had a day where I was caught, where I was completely unafraid. The phone would ring and I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, in, you know, in the evening, someone, something just blew up in Tokyo. You know, we both had jobs where there was nothing in the world that could go wrong that wouldn't create problems for us because of the extensive nature of, of, of our interests. And so I lived you know, my whole life in fear and anxiety. And as, you, as people know, that's a very big spur to motivation. So let's talk about something else early on. I have known you as a student of history. Now, did you have an interest in history when you, when you were in grade school or in high school? Or when, when, did, when did you develop the interest in history? You know, I always did. I found history transporting. I read a lot of history. I appreciate the literary way in some historians. And, you know, just to, you know, give a cliche, uh, truth is always stranger than fiction. You can't make stuff up. Imagine, you know, the movie, you know, even in the current period of this virus and how quickly the country shut down and the, and the debate back and forth. Who, would, who could write that where it would seem, uh, seem real? I always thought of history in both directions. I think about what happened before and what we're experiencing in connection with other people's experience previous to me, which has always given me, made me feel everything in context and I know things will generally work out and always made me a little bit calmer. But I always look forward too. I always think about the future. And so I always think to myself, the way we judge things in the past how will people judge us looking back from a different future? Yeah, that's you know, interesting you said that, because I remember when you and I confronted problems together and challenges together, you always said something to me, which I thought was, was uh, very reassuring. Because you always said to me, Hank, you know, today's problems always look worse than yesterday's because the future isn't determined yet. The outcome isn't determined right. yet. Once you come out the other side, obviously you, you, you breathe a sigh of relief. And just think what it would have been like had we been living you know, in, in New York or on Wall Street during the 1930s. All right, or like my father, when he was 25 years old, wakes up one Sunday morning and the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor and he's off to a war with an undetermined outcome. There's nothing that's been resolved that can be as scary as something that's resolved. So people say, oh my goodness, the polarization in politics today, it's worse than ever. And I say, you know, kind of, we did have a civil war. And they say, oh, that was so long ago. But there were other things. There was a McCarthy era. There was a lot of things that happened, but those are all in the can. They're on the shelf. They're resolved. We know it worked out. And so when something hasn't worked out, of course, we're, we don't know which direction it's gonna go into. People say, we live in such a dangerous world. You know, I remember when the North Koreans were rattling their saber or Iran. This is so, I said, what are you talking about? I'm old enough to remember, I think I was 10 years old or 11 years old during the Cuban Missile Crisis and where we were like one minute to midnight on the nuclear clock, we were DEFCON 2. DEFCON 1 is nuclear war. I think that was a little more dangerous than the world yeah, we live yeah. in today. My, my, my father, Barry Tellinoy, my father built the bomb shelter. We, we, right. we spent, that's where we stored our, all our canned vegetables and fruits you know, I mean, in, in, in the following years, but he literally it, built it, it, a bomb shelter with an air filter and a chemical toilet. But I don't get that. <laughs> to me, if there was a nuclear bomb, and somebody, I remember regulators were coming in and wanted to know our contingency plans if something went wrong. What would you do if there was a flood? What would you do if there was a fire? Then somebody asked me, what would you do if there was a dirty bomb in Manhattan? And I said, well, I'd open the window and take the deepest breath I could and let you deal with it. Because, <laughs> I mean, did your father really want to survive? And so he would get, he would reemerge 
80 years later somehow, where everything he ever knew was in devastation and everybody, you know, I mean, really? Yeah, just, just amazing. You're, you're right. Uh, sometimes uh, reality is much stranger than fiction. I want to ask you just a, a couple other questions about the, the early days. So you went and got a law degree. You never struck me as, you know, as, you know you're interested in history. You're interested in markets. Why, why did the law degree, why did you get a law degree and why didn't you practice law? Yeah, honestly, law, I, really, uh, I needed to make a living. <laughs> I mean, I got, I went to college. And, you know, I'm plodding along on my liberal arts uh, kind of social science background. And I say, hmm, I better do something. So late in my college career, I started taking pre-med courses. Could you imagine me as a, you can't imagine me as a lawyer. Can you imagine me as a, as a, as a doctor? Um, and, you know, law in a way is an extension of uh, liberal arts. And I kind of devolved into it. And once you go in that direction, I did practice law uh, for about four or five years. Uh, and I kind of like, you know, Law, when you read, you know, law, the way law evolves, especially common law, it's the law are the kind of compromises that people make so that people can live alongside each other and survive. And over time, law evolves. You know, you start about rules that govern how horses should go and they make the move to how railroads should work and how cars should work. And through trial and error and experimentation, you get the rules by which civilization can advance. And I always kind of like the concept. The concept is terrific. I even like law school. I, I, I like learning about it. But, the, but I found the practice of law uh, a little bit of drudgery. And, you know, law is one of those entry-level professions where it's a great background for other things. So right about the time when I was about four or five years into it, and a lot of my other colleagues were flaking off going into other things, I looked around and saw what other jobs could I have. I was still a pretty young guy. And so where did you, did you always have a love for markets or did that just, that just No, I had about? no idea what a market was. I think markets just fit my normal ADD pattern. Um, there was a, there's a kind of, you, you, you get the input, you get immediate, you know, you make a, you make a decision, you make a choice, you get immediate uh, feedback. It fit both my ADD and my obsessive nature. Look, I've been away from the markets for 20 years, it's been 20 years since anybody, since I sat at a desk and really made decisions based upon trying to maneuver my way through markets. But I tell you to this day, as it's an occupational hazard, I still know the price of everything all the time. And I still engage with it and I still like it. And to me, it's a, uh, the biofeedback mechanism of markets is like no other. And I find it interesting, it's the, Somebody will say, why is the price of something where it is? Nobody has to believe that that's the right price. But that's where the people who think it's worth more and the people who think it's worth less and a million decision makers, that's where it clears. And I find that, I find kind of like a, a great storyline in all of that. I love it. Well, and what really impressed me about you, Lloyd, when you were working with me and, and we were dealing with markets is you knew the details you were right down at the most granular level as you said you knew the price of everything but you always were able to put it in context and put it in context based upon what was going on around the world and in a, in a historical context and so i think being able to have the, the ground level and the big picture and to be able to think the way you did is a very uh, very unique uh, capability. People ask me, if you want to be in a market or trader, what's a good thing to study? And everyone assumes I'll say economics and markets. I'd say, you know, look, in anything, you have to be a complete person. You have to be a well-rounded person. But I really do think learning history and appreciating history, which is different than learning it, is kind of the best thing. Recognizing that there are cycles. And to paraphrase Mark Twain, and I'm not even sure Mark Twain said it, History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And you could see patterns. People get scared and people overcome their fears. And, you, and I, I think markets really blend into somebody who appreciates history and the recurrence and patterns and human nature and psychology. So before we turn to the world today, I'd like you to look back 
at your time as CEO of Goldman Sachs and talk about what, what you are most proud of. What were the changes you saw? How did you deal with them? And what are the, what are the two or three things that you're proudest of looking at your career at Goldman Sachs? Look, first of all, Hank, you handed over a firm that was, in, you know, that was very well managed and was in very good shape in the first order of business. Again, harking back to my statement earlier that I never had a day without anxiety in my life. The first thing I'm thinking is, oh my God, let me not, please let me not screw this up. Um, so that was one thing that was always on my mind. But I think, you know, we kept, I can't say I created Goldman Sachs, I certainly didn't. It's been, go, it's been pretty good for a long time. But during periods of very, very high pressure, uh, and at times when firms like ours didn't do so well, uh, we managed to do well. We, we created a place and maintained a place where the best and the brightest still wanted to come to work, uh, where we survived a lot of pressures that were on the industry and still maintained the specialness of Goldman Sachs in a way that the world would want us to be special. I'm saying a lot of people can make themselves special in ways that are antagonistic to the, to the health and safety of the world. But I think um, to this day, decades after our IPO, when we hire from the same schools, we live in the same world, we do the same business as others, Goldman Sachs still resonates as a special place. And if I didn't create it, I at least maintained it and hopefully in some ways maybe Im, uh, improved it. And with respect to crises, um, and on a personal level, uh, I discovered, I didn't know this, but it turns out I have a thick skin and in a crisis, I discovered I don't, I don't fold and I can function and I can st be strategic and I can rally people around to focus on how we work our way out of the situation that we're in and I noticed that a lot of people around me and a lot of people around you, and you had it twice, Hank, you ran the firm, but you also ran the finances of the country for a while uh, under a very pressured situation. And I'd say that we share in common at this point, and I think experience shows that ne neither one of us is gonna get hysterical and curl up in a fetal position just because there's uh, pressure and tension and, uh, and uncertain outcomes. You know, Lloyd, you've got, uh you know, the quickest wit of anyone I know. And you, you use humor very deftly to, to lead and to, uh, uh, to, to rally people. You know, it's always, uh, it, it's always easier to follow or work with someone you like and, or when it's fun to work with them than, you know, than when it's the opposite. So, you know, I, I wasn't there with you during the crisis, but it, you talk a little bit about how you use humor. Right? There probably wasn't a, m much opportunity for humor during the crisis, but but uh, talk a little no, there bit was, about it. There what, was, Hank. In, in this perspective, I remember something that was quoted uh, in a book that was written about the crisis quoted me, and I love to quote myself, why not? Um, because I remember <laughs> in the heart of the crisis when we spent like the fifth weekend in a row in the New York Fed trying to figure out how to let the markets open up Sunday night, which was Monday morning in Tokyo, one of the people, you know, we're pulling into the Fed because there are protesters around the building. We're pulling into the parking area underneath the Fed and somebody's wringing their hands and saying, woe is me, essentially, woe is me. And I said in a crowd and I said, you know, for crying out loud, we're, pull, you know, we're pulling into the basement of the New York Fed in a Mercedes. You're not getting out of a Higgins boat on Omaha Beach. Get a grip. <laughs> and I think in a way it's... Um, you know, it could be disarming. Now, I'm not conscious. I am who I am. I do think, see things in perspective and context, and that gives you a sense of where things fit in. And sometimes you come up with a humorous thing when people think the challenges you're facing are unprecedented. And of course, very little is unprecedented, really. Um, they're equivalent. Um, but I think I've also used it in cases, look, I could be a very intense person. Um, and I think in a way, I've always used, look, you're a big guy. I know in your life, big guys, when they're talking to people, have to slouch down and backwards so they're just not that intimidating. I once remember talking to someone at Goldman Sachs who was an ex-football player who would always slouch when he was talking to me. And, um, 
He, and I said, you don't have to slouch. I mean, I feel like every time you talk to me, I'm ruining your back. And he said, Lloyd, if I didn't slouch down, I'd scare you to death. <laughs> and I'm not a big guy, but I do have a very tough way of speaking. I can get very intense and I can have a very sharp tongue at times. And I'm aware of it. And the way I take the edge off sometimes is I know I'm going in that direction. And then I'll say something more sympathetic, something self-deprecating, something just to take the edge off so I'm not that intimidating because I know I can be. That's, a, that's something I've watched you do. I've seen both Lloyd Blankfeins. I've seen you ask, sitting on a, around a risk table, some of the most incisive, toughest questions. And, uh, and then I've watched you use uh, humor to disarm the situation. So I'm going to switch now to the world. So you've been watching the government's economic response to the crisis. How effective is it? And what, what are you seeing now in terms of the recovery? What, what, what are you expecting? I mean, it's, it, it, as we've talked about this early, the outcome hasn't been determined. It's, it's uncertain. But, but, but how are you seeing things right now? Yeah, first of all, on what the government did, I would say, People have to have reg real expectations. Things had to be done quickly. Precision is not available. People will write doctoral dissertations from the comfort of a carol in a library 20 years from now and talk about how everybody was so stupid, but really in the fog of war to have done things so quickly. Um, I think they've done a brilliant job. They didn't pull it out of a complete hat. They, you know, they had the, they had the history and the lessons that they learned from what uh, you and some others did in the financial crisis 10 years earlier. And so that was a big foundation to build on. They did more stuff. They got a consensus from a very polarized Congress. And so I applaud what they did. Now, everybody's gonna write about how the wrong, some wrong people got this and wrong people got that. But you know, your expectations have to be realistic. So again, I applaud what the Treasury did and I applaud what the Federal Reserve did. And we'll sort things out. And of course, mistakes were made. How could they not be? Um, and, you know, and, and they're not done yet in their activities. So I think they did, again, in the fog of war, I think they did a pretty good job. Um, as far as where we go from here, um, I think, as, as you noted, uh, it's very uncertain. The economy and Americans as a whole are quite resilient. There are going to be dramatic changes. Um, and I think people have commented on this, and I won't dwell on this, but I think that we're seeing the acceleration of a lot of patterns and trends that were occurring anyway. People were shopping at home, but you know, old people like you and me are saying, how, oh my gosh, I have to go to a store, I have to see it, they're gonna send me stuff, I'm not gonna like it, how do I walk it back, to blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? You suddenly found out you, that was the only way to shop. You know, you couldn't go squeeze the tomatoes if you, if you got groceries from an online service, but guess what? They came, they were pretty good, and we're living with it. That trend was in place, but now it's been validated as effective. Um, I think the people who are driving the economy to digital, to at home, to Zoom calls, like the one we're having now, are getting killed and criticizing the press, in part because of their great success, and I mean, they, everybody should get criticized because nobody should monopolize. But I think there's not enough commendation for people who have kind of changed the world and have got on the forefront of the changes that are taking place. So look, we'll get through this. It's slow and it's torturous when you're living through it. But when we look back at it, it'll be a blink. And, but there are changes that are taking place. Some industries won't come back. Some businesses within the industries won't come back, and we're going to have to adjust to that. So let's talk about the debates that's taking place right now in America, because we're seeing the COVID flare up in a number of states. So now we have this big discussion about protecting the public's health, uh, the, the need to, to open up and protect our economic security, uh, you know, opening up schools. You know, I I, I happen to think it's uh, it's it's very sad that uh, 
that, that, uh, that, that schools have been closed, and I'd like to see them open up as soon as possible. But there's that, it, it's talked about, some people talk about it as a trade-off, but it's how do you uh, protect health and now, resume you know, activities. But talk a little bit about that. What's, how do you see look, that? There are going to be trade-offs, but there's a false dichotomy, a false trade-off between health and the economy. Let me tell you, you are not going to have good health if the economy craters. You may not, people may not get sick from COVID, but they'll get sick from poverty, um, drug addictions, people's bad behavior, abuses, malnutrition. There's a lot of diseases of poverty and it may take longer to reflect themselves compared to a virus, but I don't think it's health versus money. It's health versus health in a way. And eventually there's going to be, everybody's going to get exposed. I, look, my own orientation is we're discovering and learning things. I think you have to protect the vulnerable politician, but for sectors of the demographics of this country, it's bad and again, when this gets viewed, we may know more and I may look stupid for saying this and I wanna know if new facts come around, I would think differently. So whatever I'm saying now, I would cause, I would reflect other knowledge that may emerge, but it looks like there's big sectors of the productive population that just statistically aren't that injured by it, but they will be injured if they can't go to work, if they can't subsist, and even though the US government is printing a lot of money to support people, it can't do that forever. And when you think of what in this country that we enjoy, like our way of life, like our living standard, depends on us being highly productive. I, and by the way, how about a generation of students that don't learn? I think there are enormous trade-offs that are being made. Now, when I'm not an epidemiologist and people listening to say, easy decision for you to make, you're well-to-do, blah, blah, blah. You're not going out, you don't need to go out and mix and mingle. But I will tell you, there's a reason why politicians make decisions. I appreciate the epidemiologists, but they're there to give input on the consequences and effects of disease. They're not there to reconcile the various trade-offs between an absolute doing the best thing to contain the disease versus the consequences and the fallout from containing them and sabotaging the economy. I, I, you know, your old boss, George W, said something he was ridiculed, and he once said, I'm the decider. Well, there needs to be a decider, and that's a profession also, like epidemiology. But I wouldn't let economists make the decision, and I wouldn't let epidemiologists make the decision. Somebody has to reconcile those forces. Lloyd, I can't uh, you know, let this conversation end without talking about Marcus. You're a student of Marcus. Put these markets in perspective. How do we explain the exuberance in the equity market, the, 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 the debt markets, given the uncertain economic outcomes? Well, how are you looking at these markets? Well, I'll tell you. I always say when somebody asks you to explain something, I always, clar I always try to clarify and say, anything that's happened, I can explain. Anything that's going on, I can explain. The real test was, if I knew everything that was gonna go on in advance, would I have been able to, to predict the outcome? I can explain what's going on, but if you ask me, if you told me about the virus, you told me about the Fed action, you told me about all the inputs, would I have predicted everything? No but that won't stop me from explaining to you why I think we got to where we got. So there's limits to it all. But I would just say at the point where the, first of all, markets tend to look forward. This is not gonna go on forever. There'll be treatments, there may be a virus. We'll get better at handling it, we'll get used to it. People are resilient and we'll adapt to it. And it's always sooner than people think. And so markets are looking at that and looking forward. Secondly, the markets are not just everything going up. The state, you know, the, the trend, the, the companies that reflect the trend where the world is going anyway and getting too quicker, those are really going up and driving it. And those are the most very successful companies and they're dominating the indices. So it looks like the markets as a whole are going up when I'm, I'm saying equity markets in this. 
But really, the markets are making judgments about winners and losers here, as markets should. The other thing is the Fed, you know, you take interest rates to zero, you know, income producing assets like a bond. You take, you take interest rates to zero, bond prices go to infinity. And in a way, any income producing company, that the valuations are going to go higher because interest rates are lower. Look, if companies could borrow at very, very low rates, whatever income they're earning doesn't have to go back, doesn't go to pay the debt service because debt service is very cheap. Those go to the shareholders who value those and then want to buy those assets and are willing to pay a higher price for those income producing assets. And so the low interest rates, the stimulus that was provided is also having an effect on this. But I think the biggest effect is looking through and deciding that some parts, of, you know, it's not going to last forever. And nobody want, and the markets tend to look through it. And the market is something different than individuals. The market is an entity in of itself. And now also, that being said, and I'm aware that this will be viewed at a time, and I like to, I like to protect myself, I'm still, having said all that, I wouldn't have expected it. Again, I'm giving you my best explanation for why we're here. And by the way, there's plenty of time for the market to crack and punish all those people who are complacent. See, Lloyd, what I love about you and markets, you always looked at them with a sense of humility. You and I were always suspicious of the traders that had a strong view and wouldn't change it, right? They knew what the world was like. They knew what the markets were going to do. They knew they were right and the markets were wrong, right? And, and let me tell you, my aspiration in life, I'd say predicting the future was beyond my grasp. I thought it was a formidable undertaking to try to predict the present. Yeah. Like, in other words, just think about it. It's, the future is hard and sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. But it's, it's a challenge and important just to decide what's really going on today. Yep. It's hard to predict the present, let alone, let alone the future. You're asking me what's going on, and where you know people can't get a grasp on that. I think that's within the realm of possibility. But the future, I used to always say to people, I'm not in the I'm not in the forecasting business. I'm in the contingency planning business. Well, that's a great attitude to have, particularly when you're running a large financial institution. Now. I, I'm going to give you a, a last word here because you talked early on in this interview about being driven by a certain extent insecurity, fear, etc. But I know you as someone looking to the future always with optimism. Okay. So tell me as you look forward, what are the things to be optimistic about if, if you're a young person in America today? Well, look, people economy, people, our country particularly, we're resilient. Everybody, again, is wringing their hands, woe is me, look how terrible it is. But it's not. I mean, you know, Hank, in my lifespan, I, I'm 65 years old. I couldn't have picked a better 65 years to occupy in American or world history. I was born after, you know, after World War II and after Korea, you know, there was, I didn't have the depression, no global wars. And, you know, there are, there are challenges. There's, you know, inequality. We have to deal with a lot of things, but we will. We're, again, resilient and adaptable. And generally, we're, you know, progress occurs. And I think America, for all the chaos, I mean, America prog is progressive because of the of progress. If you are a centralized decision-making country, of course you're gonna get things wrong, but it's gonna look neat as hell, and it's gonna look efficient as hell. But if you're a place where there's millions of decision-makers, and the ones who make bad decisions get winnowed out, the ones who get make right decisions are validated, and everybody goes in the direction of what works, progress go, occurs very quickly, and so I'm pretty serene that, that we're always going to work through our problems here and come out better. And by the way, we, we've taken a lot of detours along the way, and there's a lot of flaws in the system that have to be fixed. But we always advance. We always come out right. Well, Lloyd, 
Thank you very much. That's a good way to end this, and I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Well, thank you, Hank, uh, and thank for everything you've done and that you do. I appreciate it. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.